Welcome to this video on the concepts of utopia, dystopia and movement. This video was first produced as part of the course Fleeing Forward – Refugees, Migrants and Other Travellers in Australian Dystopian Fiction. Naturally, one of the first questions this title poses is how these, at first glance, wildly different topics fit together. But fit together they do, at least that's what I would argue. So let's take a look at what these concepts actually mean, starting with the idea of utopia. A utopia, broadly speaking, is a place or society in which conditions are ideal. A utopia is an ideal model of how the world should be and what present-day society should aspire to. The concept itself predated Thomas More's 1516 text Utopia, but it can still be considered a foundational text of the genre. As Fatima Vieira tells us, the word utopia came into being to allude to imaginary paradisical places, and it has also been used to describe a particular kind of narrative which became known as utopian literature. This was a new literary form, and its novelty certainly justified the need for a neologism. This neologism is interesting in and of itself. Utopia, as more intended it, actually derives from the Greek words ouk, meaning not, and topos, meaning place. It is literally a place that does not exist, thus indicating perhaps the future-oriented and indeed speculative nature of utopian literature. It is not, however, the good place that we might expect, and arguably how we often understand the word today. That would be utopia, with an EU, which is in fact a word more also uses, and which the personified island of utopia states should be its name. Since the terms are pronounced in the exact same way, the terms are easily conflated, and when we study utopia, we usually do think of it as a positive space rather than an imaginary one, even though it is always, by necessity, both. The study of utopian literatures, however, does include other kinds of non-spaces that are not necessarily ideal models for society. The most popular of these genres, whose designation have arisen from Moore's original utopia, is undoubtedly the dystopia. Most of you will have read or watched one or several already. We could list quite a number of them, both old and new, without much thought. As for the classics, 1984, Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451 uh, immediately come to mind. Margaret Edwards' The Handmaid's Tale may also be counted as a classic by this point, but there are numerous others. YA examples like the Divergent series or The Hunger Games, as well as the countless other iterations riding on the success of the aforementioned trilogies, speak of the enormous popularity of dystopian narratives in the contemporary literary market and I bet that you can probably name many more on a moment's notice. Australian literature even seems to be especially suited to dystopian narratives, and there are many fascinating examples, but that's a topic for its own video. Before we go into the details of the relationship between utopia, dystopia and movement, let's look at the meaning of dystopia on its own. The term was first used in 1747 in a speech by John Stuart Mill to criticise the British treatment of the Irish, but it was not widespread until the late 20th century. As with utopia, however, dystopia too has antecedents predating the coinage of the term. The themes always follow whatever negative development is most feared at the moment of writing. Thus Huxley's Brave New World takes on Bolshevism and eugenics, Orwell's 1984 focuses on the surveillance state, and Margaret Edwards' The Handmaid's Tale deals with the oppression of women. Other popular themes are nuclear disaster, climate change, and various versions of fascist regimes taking over. Frequently, such dystopian tales, rather than reveling in bleakness, seek to inspire change by motivating readers to prevent these horrifying futures from happening. Such dystopias are also called critical dystopias, and this critical dystopian mode still offers contemporary literature, film, art and other media an opportunity to intervene in respect of the concrete problems in the contemporary world. Issues including social injustice, climate change, species extinction, gender regulations and racial prejudice. For more on definitions, as well as on the inherent instability of the terms utopia and dystopia and their many ambiguities, I'd recommend checking out David Kahn's video on utopia, dystopia and the spaces in between. 
While the notions of utopia as a non-place and of utopia and dystopia existing within one another are certainly helpful, especially within the context of Australian dystopian fiction, I want to focus on mobility rather than spaces for this video. Referring once more to Vieira's entry on the concept of utopia in the Cambridge Companion to Utopian Literature, we can see that utopian literature is, at its very conception, intrinsically linked to notions of travel, specifically to the so-called age of exploration, or rather, as we'd see it today, the beginning of European colonization spreading across the globe. Moore wrote his utopia inspired by the letters in which Amerigo Vespucci, Christopher Columbus and Angelo Poliziano described the discovery of new worlds and new peoples. Geographical expansion inevitably implied the discovery of the other, and Moore used the emerging awareness of otherness to legitimize the invention of other spaces with other people and different forms of organization. This inspiration from travellers' accounts is clearly visible in Moore's Utopia. It is no coincidence that the main source of information on the island of Utopia is a traveller, like Ulysses or even Plato, who reports not some far-fetched traveller's tale of unseen and faraway monsters, but on examples of social structures all around the world. And this is a, quite an interesting quote from the text itself. Uh, we did not ask him if he had seen any monsters, for monsters have ceased to be news. There's never any shortage of horrible creatures who prey on human beings, snatch away their food or devour whole populations. But examples of why social planning are not so easy to find. This quote from Moore's Utopia refers to the tradition of travellers' tales, and indeed old-fashioned maps to place monstrous beings at the utmost fringes of the known world, on the blank spaces of a map. Perhaps this could even be understood as one of the origins of dystopia, which is also most often placed in the future and so at a great distance from its readers. Though, as we might be tempted to believe in 2022, not at so great a distance as we might like. The traveller in Moore's text, Raphael Nonsenso, quite a telling name, proceeds to tell more about the Republic of Utopia, a reference to Plato's Republic, no doubt, which he has allegedly visited himself. According to Vieira, a utopian narrative often follows a similar template to Moore's fictional narrative, sometimes with a similar frame narrative included. It normally pictures the journey by sea, land or air of a man or woman to an unknown place an island, a country or a continent. Once there, the utopian traveller is usually offered a guided tour of the society and given an explanation of its social, political, economic and religious organisation. This journey typically implies the return of the utopian traveller to his or her own country in order to be able to take back the message that there are alternative and better ways of organising society. Interestingly, Vieira brings up the high number of rules that often accompany utopian societies. Because utopists very often distrust individuals' capacity to live together, we very frequently find a rigid set of laws at the heart of utopian societies, rules that force the individuals to repress their unreliable and unstable nature and put on a more convenient social cloak. Considering this rigid set of laws, it is perhaps not a surprise that dystopia is inherently already present within utopia. After all, the oppressive government is one of the most frequent staples in dystopian fiction, and it seems only intent and effect that distinguishes its actions from that of a utopian government. Utopia and dystopia can also be seen as a set of binary oppositions where one could not exist without the other, and we often find elements of utopia within dystopia and vice versa. Another point of connection between utopia and dystopia is the genre's unstable relationship to the primary world beyond narrative. In utopian literature, the traveller departs from a real place, visits an imagined place and goes back home, which situates utopia at the boundary between reality and fiction. This allows writers to propose alternative solutions to social issues and simultaneously criticize society's currently employed solutions without potentially endangering themselves as they are still writing fiction. 
Over time, however, this relationship somewhat changed in that the utopian society was more and more frequently projected into the future and thus presented as positive developments that had their origins in change enacted upon contemporary conditions and might thus be achievable in reality. Such shifts in proximity within utopian fiction can refer to both temporal and spatial proximity and they always denote a kind of movement. This is similar in modern dystopian fiction, in which the future events are usually extrapolated from contemporary developments, which have been spun further into the most negative outcome imaginable. Uh, this is also where the title of the original course this video was a part of derives from. In both utopian and dystopian literature, we, both readers and writers, flee forward into the future, either towards hopeful and optimistic outcomes or towards worst-case scenarios, which function as cautionary tales and perhaps seek to prevent the future they depict. We have now already come across two kinds of movements in the context of utopian and dystopian literature. One, the movement that is involved in the original pattern for utopian narrative and includes movement of the utopian traveller to the utopian place and back to reality. The other, the movement we, as writers and readers, perform to extrapolate from our contemporary existence towards the future, both in best-case and worst-case scenarios. A third kind of movement, that of migrants and refugees, seems to be almost inherently suited to dystopian fiction, due to the often harrowing conditions depicted. But contrary to what one might expect, the motive of migrants and refugees has, until recently, not taken centre stage within dystopian fiction, though it has certainly not been absent either. You might, for example, think of the Women's Underground Railroad from Gilead to Canada, established within Margaret Edwards' well-known novel The Handmaid's Tale. Nasia Anam, in an article entitled The Migrant as Colonist, Dystopia and Apocalypse in the Literature of Mass Migration, cites two almost diametrically opposed threats that might feature in contemporary dystopian fiction. The threat may be perceived as the kind of military violence, political upheaval or climate disaster that compels people to migrate away from their homelands. Contrarily, the threat may be perceived as the arrival of those very migrants themselves. Anam suggests that an increasing number of European works depict the Western world as about to meet its demise at the hands of colonizing Muslim migrants, betraying a pervasive anxiety about the growth of Islam on the continent. This is, however, not the kind of migration and re refugee movement that will be the focus of this video and, indeed, of the class it originated in. Instead, we are looking for refugees who try to escape the dystopia in order to analyse how they are portrayed within their dystopian story worlds. Anand's take on dystopian narratives that centre on refugees rather than on those terrified by them is undoubtedly useful in our further exploration of movement especially that of migrants and refugees in dystopian literature. The migrant, if marked as a latter-day colonizer, Anam states, can only be interpreted as a harbinger of the end of the world. However, if loosed from the tethers of these centuries-old apocalyptic narratives of Europe and its others, iterations of which inform modern-day laws of national boundaries and citizenship now precipitating the direst of consequences, the figure of the global migrant instead becomes an exemplary world citizen in our era of widespread political, environmental and social upheaval. In this reframing of the refugee, refugees and migrants become a symbol of hope rather than a harbinger of doom because they already refuse the narrative of apocalypse that marks the very act of migration by seeking respite and better conditions elsewhere. It is this very act of trying to escape the dystopian end times that may suggest an end to the foundational apocalyptic narrative framework on which the idea of Europe and the West are predicated. Certainly, this argument can also be tested against the portrayal of refugees in Australian speculative fiction. We will explore, both in the course and on this channel, how various forms of movement feature in Australian dystopias. And since we cannot possibly cover all dystopias from the continent, we're also hoping that this video might inspire you to take up the research as well.